Well, it's six o'clock, y'all. We're glad to see y'all. I'm glad to see y'all. I'm glad if y'all be able to see me, too. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'm thankful to be here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start with a prayer. And uh, we want to especially remember tonight, as we have our prayer, uh, Margaret and Aaron. They moved hospice with Aaron and uh, not doing well at all. And uh, so it's, it's a pretty tough situation right now. So we want to remember her in our prayers. Is there any other special announcements that we need to make before we have our prayer tonight? Time changes Sunday. Okay. Need to be praying for the election too, y'all. I know that's that's dogmatic <laughs> to, to say that, but boy, I'm hoping and praying, yeah. Bruce, you start us, please. <clears throat> always sad for me whenever I <clears throat> learn about people that are struggling the way they are and especially as many times as I have begged to obey the gospel uh, that's what makes me so sad about that situation but tonight <clears throat> the apostle Paul in his writings throughout the Bible Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Those books, aside from the book of Hebrews that we don't really know, but those books, what did he write in those books that really and truly gave us some guidelines of how to live life? I began to study some of the writings of the Apostle Paul in depth and look at some of the things and I've I've discussed these before but some of the things that the Apostle Paul and we we looked at his life and our Bible basics and some of the things that went along with him and we know that uh, apparently there was something somewhere that was plaguing him I don't know what the thorn in the flesh was uh, Joe do you have any idea I mean only a guess, only a guess. Uh, somebody's always said it could have been his eyesight, and others say other things about it. But nevertheless, the Apostle Paul struggled throughout his tenure as a chosen apostle out of due season. But he wrote so many things, so many things, uh, that concerns our everyday life. And, and, you know, I know some of you have said to me that you like the lessons sometimes that I bring because it, it pertains to everyday life. Well, I think the Bible pertains to everyday life, and I think sometimes if we use these and utilize these things, we can live a better life, and we can go to heaven when this life is over. So tonight, the Apostle Paul, in his writings, some of the things that he's told us that will help us to live a good, wholesome Christian life. Now, Galatians 6 and verse number 1 and 2 will be our start. Terry, we'll start in the back over there on your side. Then we'll go over here to Betty. Betty, you'll be going to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And we might do 3. Okay, Terry, let's start right there. Galatians 6, 1. Yes, and 2. Brother, if a man be overtaken in a fall, 
you which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, least though also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, let's talk about the, the thought here. If a man be overtaken in a fault, what do y'all suppose that really means? If a man be overtaken in a fault, Okay, some type of sin, something that somebody's caught themselves up in. It might be, uh, might be partaking of a uh, a drug, or it might be partaking of alcohol. It might be uh, different things that people get involved in that they shouldn't. Uh, might be caught in a lie. Anybody, you know, we we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, but. Maybe we, maybe we just distorted the truth and, and we got caught up with. Uh, he says, now look, if a man be overtaken in a fault, that means that that has known and, and it's been brought out. How should we live our lives as a Christian? How, do, how should we deal with that? How should we treat our fellow man that's been overtaken in a fault? He says, now look at this. He said, you restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Now, I don't know anybody perfect, do y'all? I mean, I'm talking about adults now. Don't get me wrong. I know plenty of perfect people that's, that little children. I mean, little babies, they're perfect, you know. There's no sin there. And little, little boys and girls that hadn't reached the age of accountability yet, they're, they're perfect. You know, if something happens to them... They, they will, they'll go to heaven. There's no doubt about that. There's no argument to that, regardless of what somebody might say. But if we're an adult and we find a situation where someone's been overtaken in a fault, he said, you consider yourself, that you restore that person in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. Now, what does that tell us about how to live our life? Anybody in the room want to say you're perfect? Shut up, Pam. No, ser <laughs> no seriously, think about it. None of us are above or beyond sin. You know, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And nobody likes to admit that. Nobody even likes to think about that. But, you know, it could be a minor and somebody said, what's, what's the difference in a minor sin and a major sin? A sin's a sin, the consequences is the same. I understand that, but from the human standpoint. Now, if you go out here and you murder somebody, I classify that as a bad, bad thing. But if you tell a lie and get caught up in it, it might, it's not nowhere to me near as bad as murdering somebody, but the consequences is the same. Can it cost you your soul? Yes. So the Apostle Paul says, Look, I want you to consider yourself and help to restore this one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self. Now, I think the way we ought to put that in our lives is consider the fact that, you know, we may be really upset with this person, we may be really down on this person because of what something they did, but don't forget you're human too. And something could very easily come on your side of the track. I mean, you could actually mess up too, right? Nobody wants to say in this audience that they've ever messed up before. But I'll say it. You know, I messed up before. You lose your temper, you do things, you say things that are not. And, you know, this is what the Apostle Paul said. You use this as a rule. This is one, rule number one. Person's overtaken in a sin. Look at this situation. And consider yourself and help to restore this individual. And do it in the spirit of meekness. Now, what does that mean, spirit of meekness? Anybody got any thoughts on that? Humility, right? Kindness, okay, good. All right, now, <clears throat> the latter part of that said, Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I've had people confess things to me having been in the ministry a long time, I'm sure Joe has, and, uh, and some of the rest of you may have too, I don't know, <clears throat> and you carry it. And they'll say, I don't ever tell nobody that. Don't ever tell nobody that. 
just don't tell. You know, you bear that burden. You handle that. And that's, you know, and I've often said, if anybody calls me with a problem, if anybody calls me and they want to talk to me about a problem, it's not going no further than me. I wouldn't be doing what I need to be doing if I, if I went out here and told everybody, you know what old Bruce told me? And then you go and tell them. And he can't do that. So that's, this is rule number one. Let's see what we can find in rule number two. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to do uh, Ephesians 4. Betty, you got it? One and two. Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Go ahead and read 3 2, Betty. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, this uh, rule here. He said, You walk worthy of the vocation wherein, wherewith you were called. Now, I think this means you conduct yourself as a Christian. Now, everybody I know that professes to be a Christian, they don't always conduct themselves that way, right? This is rule number two. If we're going to portray ourselves as a Christian, if we're going to, if we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and we, we attend services regularly and we do the things we ought to do, we ought to walk. In, in a situation, you know, we ought to think about this. Walk worthy of the vocation. We shouldn't ever have to have anybody say something like this. If they're a Christian, then the woods is full of them. Anybody ever heard that before? <clears throat> I've had that said before, not so much about me. Uh, so They probably said it about me. I don't know, but I, I know they've said it about certain people that that I've known over the years, they say, well, if, if they're a Christian, then the woods is full of them. You know, walk worthy of that vocation, rule number two. That means conduct yourself as a Christian in every aspect of your life, you know. And that means, you know, control yourself, self-control. That's, that's a big thing of, of, about being a Christian is being able to control oneself things you say, the things you do, the way you act. You know, nobody should ever have to say, uh, you know, if that's a Christian, you know, then the woods is full of, you know, that we should not have to have anybody question our Christianity. Rule number two. When you say vocation, y'all may have a different translation, but you know, that, that covers a lot of ground. That's your mannerism, your actions, your vocabulary, the things you say, the things you do. All that fits into this. That's your vocation, you know. That's everything you're about, you know, the way you act, the way you talk. The way you, it could be even your outward appearance. Y'all ever thought about that? I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. I know an individual that really and truly, and, I, and some of y'all may have them, and that's fine if you do. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm going to talk about a tattoo. But I don't think you ought to tattoo your face and do derogatory things on your body. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, if I come in with a bone stuck through my nose and, and, and big ear bobs hanging out my ears, uh, you know, I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's really the look of a Christian. Do y'all? I mean, and if I come in and I had a sword tattooed down my nose and, and, and I had a bird over here and a frog over here and maybe a turtle over here. Y'all think about that. Anybody ever seen anything like that? I see it all the time. Yes, sir? If you come in dressed like that, I'm going to say, if you're a Christian, the woods is full of <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but in all honesty, I mean, now I'm not, I, I'm not, I didn't say anything about those things you can't see. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not going to get into that, that thought of it, you know, because that's Old Testament. That's not new. I could carry you to a place, you know, about when it talks about those kind of things. But nevertheless, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to offend anybody. But I do want to tell you that, you know, your outward appearance, 
we ought, we ought to even, that's part of our vocation, you know. Uh, if I came in here without a shirt on, you know, and, 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 and I didn't have any shoes on, and I was barefooted, and I was in a pair of shorts, you know, uh, that's, not, that's not the vocation of a Christian. So, anyway, let's go see if we can see something else. Let's look at another rule over here. Marilyn, let's, let's, let's go to verse 26 of uh, Ephesians 4. Let's see what we can find out here. Uh, but this is 26, 27. All right. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. We'll probably have to tie these two together. But first of all, I'll ask the question. Anybody in this room ever been angry before? <laughs> I guess everybody has, hasn't we? Okay. Now, sometimes when we get angry, it may very well constitute sin. Now, what would that, what would that, what's the measure of that? I, anybody ever got mad and angry and broke something? And you wish you hadn't done it. <laughs> and then maybe you said something and you just, oh, man, I can't believe I said that. Uh-huh. Those are things, Paul says, you be angry and sin not. And he said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, uh, kind of like my grandpa used to tell me when I lived with him in the summer months every year because I was a lifeguard. After my uncle drowned, did I, my family went crazy and I, I became a lifeguard. Okay. Well, anyway, I lived with my granddaddy every summer. And uh, he'd say to me, he said, boy, you get mad, you better get over it. You better get over it quick. i give you something to be mad about. Well, you know, I understood that, you know, except there was times in life whenever I, I'd go to work and come home and I, I wouldn't be in the best frame of mind and get in trouble. Well, see, a Christian, they have to, they have to understand the, the point here. Be ye angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't, don't let it be to the point where you give place to the devil. The devil can get you pretty easy sometimes. Everybody believe me on that? He does. He absolutely does. And sometimes we make it real easy, Brent. We do. Uh, now we can we can use verse twenty eight, but I'm gonna let Sarah read verse twenty nine. Sarah, that's Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty nine. Okay. Here's another rule. And we'll tie it together. Corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's a rule. But that which is good to the use of edifying. Now, first of all, let's talk about the corrupt communication. That don't necessarily mean bad words. Corrupt communication could be stirring up trouble. Anybody ever been around somebody that just loves stir up trouble and they, they'd just, well, they'd finagle some kind of tale and, and before you know it, everybody's mad at everybody, you know. Corrupt communication. Some things is better left unsaid. And, you know, corrupt communication cannot all the time necessarily mean a bad word or a curse word. A corrupt communication might very well just entail some kind of a lie, you know, or some kind of tale that somebody's brought out and, 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 and they know it's not true. That's exactly right. That's right. That's corrupt communication. That's exactly right. That's a good good way to, to think about that. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, uh, notice this. No, notice the rule though. He said, "Don't use the corrupt communication, but use that which is good to the to the betterment of edification, to the use of edifying." 
Now, what does the word edifying mean? Okay. Build up, lift up. Okay. Uh, how many of us like to be flattered? You know, uh, you all know what the word flattered means? I don't mean, I mean, you know, it means a lot of things, but it, to be flattered means that somebody bragged on you. You know, somebody said something good about you. That's what flattery means. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, he said, use it to the good of edifying. Now, let me, let me tell you how it works. I, I've said this before. Some of y'all have been in the class. You, you've heard me tell this tale a lot of times. I thought when I became a dad and my son was born, I thought he was going to be the, the athlete, the best athlete on the field. I thought that because, you know, when I played ball, you know, I went to the World Series, you know. I thought it was great, you know. And I said, well, he's going to be the same way. He's going to do good. But little old Matthew, he wasn't into, he wasn't into the sports like that. And boy, howdy boy, I dogged him like nobody's business. And you know what that did for him? It didn't help him none. It made it worse. You're right, Lamar. It made it worse. And I learned a hard lesson. If you can't say something good, you know, just keep your mouth shut. And, you know, he, he wasn't that good at, at basketball. He wasn't that good at baseball. But I tell you what, he's 12 times smarter than I am. <laughs> and ain't no doubt about that. Do what? Oh, okay. That's all right. Ain't no problem. But maybe they're learning a rule here. Uh, to the use of edifying, build a person up. So it may not do what we want it to do, but if we brag on somebody, you know, we can get a lot further along with them than we can if we don't. If we, if we destroy them, you know, that's terrible. Whenever it is that we, if we talk down to them, you know what's going to happen? We ain't going to never make no inroads that way. Uh, Paul said, you, you don't use corrupt communication. Don't let that proceed out of your mouth. And then turn around and says, but you use that that's good for edifying, to build people up. And I think that to be something we all can can take to the bank on something worthwhile. Any thoughts or comments? If not, let's stay there in Ephesians 4. And let's go over to uh, 31 and 32. Ephesians 4, 31, 32. Lamar, I'm going to call on you on that one. 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking take away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Okay. Now, we covered a lot of the first part of what he just read when we talked about speaking. But let's look at the second part of this and concentrate a little bit on this. Be ye kind one to another. Now, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And then he gives reasons for that. And now this is a rule that the Apostle Paul has put out there to try to encourage these people. He's writing this letter over there to the church at Ephesus, and he's trying his best to emphasize to them how to build themselves up and how to strengthen the church there. And he says, first of all, you be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Now, I know that I've preached on forgiveness, and I know that it's, it's the hardest thing in the world for a lot of people, self-included. But when you think about this, he says, first of all, start with kindness. And then he says, tenderhearted. Now, 
What does that mean? Can anybody give me any kind of a, a, a look at tenderhearted? What, what is that? Compassion is one way. You know, okay, I think consideration has a lot to do with being tenderhearted. You know, sometimes we may not consider somebody's situation. You know, we may be kind to them, you know, and we may be a little bit tenderhearted, but we may not consider them in their situation. You know, I know people that deals with a lot of different things that are very difficult to deal with. And, you know, we don't, we don't have any, I know, I know a person that has a, a, a child that's extremely afflicted, you know, with all kind of physical ailments. And occasionally I go by and talk to them, and they say, you just don't know. You just you have no idea. You know, child grows up, becomes an adult, and you still have to do the same things with an adult that's in bad shape as you do a child. So you have no idea. You know, and I, I've learned tenderhearted means you start considering somebody in their situation, and you look at their situation. And, man, I'm telling you, you know, if you're taking care of somebody and all their needs and all their, their, the things that, that a person has to be taken care of with, especially if it's an adult taking care of an adult, if it's their child and, and they're taking care of them, that's a, that's a difficult, difficult thing. And, you know, tenderhearted means you've got to consider that. You've got to think about that. You've got to think, oh, my goodness. Give some consideration to people who deal with lots of things that we just ordinarily, we wouldn't want to deal with, but we might have to. You know, and that's what Paul's rule is. He said, you, you be kind one to another, but you be tenderhearted. Now, the forgiving part is a hard one to talk about. Because people say that's one of the hardest things in the world to deal with. And probably it is. But I will tell you this. If Jesus can do it on the cross, when he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, then what, what about me? Can I carry anything beyond that? I mean, my goodness, if he's, if he's to the point of being able to do that when they're killing him, what about me? I've had people tell me, say, now, I can forgive it, but I can't forget it. What's wrong with that? Is that true forgiveness? I think, well, Nicole shook her head, and I agree with her. No, I, I don't think that's true forgiveness. I, you know, people disagree with me on that. But, you know, if I forgive it, i got to leave it alone. Go on. Move on. Forget that. It's over with. I forgave it. It's done. Don't mention it no more. Don't. Don't let it be that, that that stays with you constantly. You know, it's a plague. You know, if you can't forgive, it, it will become a plague. And it, it'll plague you all your life. You got to live with it. I mean, I've known brothers and sisters that hadn't spoke to each other in 20 years. Over $1,500 or an old pickup truck. An old house that's falling down. What about that? I mean, that's just not good, you know. There's people out there that just can't manage this. But if Christ can do it on the cross, y'all remember I said this. He's recording it. If Christ can do it on the cross, what right do I have not to forgive? You know, that's, that's a big thing. And that's one of the rules that he made. Uh, now, uh, let's, let's go on with something else. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 16 and 17. Libby, I'm going to call on you on this one. This is Ephesians 5, verse 16 and 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Did I call it out wrong? I guess I did. Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16. Oh, okay. I, yeah, okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Uh, and see, walking cir circumspectfully, not as fools. Now, she just read that for us. Now, let's think about this for a moment. How is it that you walk circumspectly? 
You know, somebody said, that's a big word, and I don't understand it. But if you walk circumspectfully, what does that mean? Hmm? Carefully. You're, you're cautious. If you walk circumspectfully, you watch where you're stepping. You know, that's what it's all about. That, that, yeah, like Alan said, it's like that word we used the other day, prudent. But, you know, watch where you, watch where you go and, and, and walk with consideration. Now, she read the second part, redeeming the time because of days of evil. How many of us waste time? Ain't none of us in this room. Sandy raised her hand. All them women in the back raised their hand. Cheyenne, you didn't raise your hand, so I'm going to make you read next. <laughs> you be looking up Philippians 2, verse 3, while I'm talking here. Let's talk about redeeming the time because the days are evil. We've got to make good use of our time. You know, we're only going to be here for a time, and we've got to make good use of it. And that's a rule that Paul made. Uh, he, he's put it out there. He said, you, you use good time. Use your time wisely. Brother Wallace told me years and years ago, he said, you know what, Gary, you, you got all the time you're ever going to have. And it ain't going to be no more. So you use it wisely. And he was right, you know. So I think sometimes we do waste our time when we could be doing something worthwhile, don't we? I mean, sometimes we do things that we, it's not really an accomplishment. It's more of a hindrance than it is anything else because we're not utilizing our time wisely. And that's really what he's talking about. The man that only had one talent in the Bible, he utilized the, the situation here. He, that's a man that wasted time, you know. Uh, all right, Cheyenne, let's go with this one over here in Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. This is a hard one right here. A lot of people don't even like to deal with it. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now, somebody tell me what vainglory is. Anybody got any idea about that? Huh? Selfish ambition is okay. We'll utilize that. That's right. That's right. Strife means, you know, when you think about it, vain glory is you take the credit for something somebody else did. Okay? That's the best way I know to put it. That's the way Grandpa used to define it. You, you take credit for something you didn't do. You didn't do that. Oh, but you told somebody you did, or you took the credit for it, they thought you did, and you didn't tell them you didn't do it, right? That's vain glory, you know, taking credit for something you didn't do. You may not have told them you did it, but you took the credit for it, right? And there's always somebody going to beat somebody's story, right? It don't make no difference. It's always somebody got to be a little better at some, whatever it is that, that, that goes in life. And that's, that's something that Paul said, you don't let it be done through strife or vainglory. Don't, strife means aggravating, you know, causing problems. Don't, you know, some people love to stir up a problem. Anybody know anybody like that? There's lots of people. Even in the Lord's church, there's a lot of people that likes to stir up trouble. They just get all kind of fuzzy about stirring up problems. And, and that's what a rule that Paul said. Don't let it be done through strife and vainglory. But in lowliness of mind and esteeming others better than themselves. You know, I, I think sometimes when somebody does something really good and then they back away from it and let somebody else take the credit for it, esteeming others better than themselves. Not necessarily do you have to do that, but, you know, I've known people before that really and truly there may have, been, may have been some benevolence done for somebody and, and somebody spoke up and took the credit and somebody that really did it kind of stood back. And, you know, that's what it's all about, you know, esteeming others better than themselves. Don't take all the credit for everything, but just kind of back away sometimes. It, you'll get your reward for it, no doubt about it. Now, 
We're going to really get in trouble on this next one. We're going to stay in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to go to verse number 14. Gary Bragg, I'm going to get you on this one. Okay, Philippians 2 and 14. Yes, sir. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Read verse 15 too. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Mm-hmm. Any more our nation has been that long today? <laughs> <laughs> we, we certainly are. <laughs> Do all things without murmuring and disputing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. This one right here has caused me a lot. I've got several demerits because of this verse right here, you know. Uh, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Anybody ever do anything, complain about it? Shut up, Pam. <laughs> See, Nicole's even raising Terry's hand over there. <laughs> do, I mean, there's a lot of people that do a lot of things, and they're good at it, but they complain about it. It's just a constant, you know, murmuring about it. You know, I've been guilty of this lots of times, and this is one of those rules that Paul made. He said, look, you do all things without murmuring and disputing. Don't complain about it. Just get it done. I've sat there and complained about the grass growing because I had to cut the grass. Anybody ever done that before? <laughs> you know, the grass grows <laughs> if it's going <laughs> to. If you got grass in the yard, it's going to grow. And I complain about it because I said, oh, I just cut it last week. I'm tired of cutting this, you know. But that's just part of life. You know, we, sometimes we just can't do things without murmuring and complaining. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> things look a whole lot better then. <laughs> now, Gary read verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation. I want to tell you all something. I, I've been guilty of this constantly. I have complained about our nation because we're in such a dire strait. And I've complained about it and complained about it and complained about it. But you know what it's done? It ain't done no good. It's still in the same mess it was when I started complaining. And it looks like it's going to be in the same mess when I get through complaining. So... It's just inevitable that we have to be careful and understand what the principle of what the Apostle Paul was, was giving us. He's writing to the church at Philippi, and he's ta- telling those Philippians, you, you do these things without murmuring and complaining. Now, there was a lot of problems with the church. You know, when y'all were in my Bible uh, basics class, there were a lot of things wrong in these, these congregations. You know, these were Christian people, but there were a lot of things wrong. And, and some of the things wrong here at Philippi was the fact that there was all kind of dissension there in the church, murmuring and complaining. Still hadn't changed, is it? I, you know, I, I, I don't know how, we, how we're going to fix it, but, you know, I think I would encourage people as I have this week, to pray about it. That's the best way I know to fix it, is pray about it. Let's see. uh, Verse number 6 of Philippians 4. Tina, verse number 6 of Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. I think sometimes if we could count our blessings and go to God with thanksgiving before we ever go to God with all the problems that we face. You know, do we have things to be thankful for? I mean, we have lots to be thankful for. And sometimes it may take somebody to call our attention to that. And I'm honest with you about it. I've had people, you know, call me up and just, they're they're dismal, they're, they're, they're miserable. And I say, look, I said, I don't know how to fix this for you, but I know that there's got to be some good in your life. Tell me something good that you have in your life that you can be thankful for. And when you get them started on that track, 
sometimes they begin to kind of mellow out, you know. I'm not the best philosopher in the world, but I've, I've counseled a lot of people in my life about a lot of things. But if you can get people started with thanksgiving, they have a tendency to really, really start pulling themselves out of the ditch. Because sometimes we may have to look at all the good before we ever face the bad. You all agree with that? Sometimes we may need to look at all the good before we ever start looking at the bad. Because some of us probably got some bad, but we got good too. And, and make sure the good outweighs the bad. Yes, sir. I think we all need to look at the good. More things to, to, that we're blessed by than what the, the bad part that we're thinking about. It might be in our mind the strongest, but like you say, we're being blessed. Every time you breathe, you're blessed. Yeah, I think so, and I think sometimes we may use that philosophy whenever that, long years ago they said, you know, the man that had no shoes complained about his no having no shoes until he met the man that had no feet. It can always be, even if it's dismal, there, there's something there that's better. There's something somewhere that's better, and it, it's something to think about, and that's what one of the rules that Paul has made to, when he's writing to these churches, he said, look, you need to be careful. And, and just like that verse said, rejoice in the Lord always and let your moderation be known to all men, but be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, verse number 8 in that same chapter, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Let's see, Sandra, if you want to read. Okay, here's some of the things with the rule that you can look at. <laughs> Honest, just, pure, good report, virtue, praise. All these things, he says, you, you think on these things. Now, I think Paul did a good job when he's trying to encourage the churches. You know, I think when you, when you study all the books, all the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, to the different churches and, and all the things that he put in those. He always tried to find a way to help them. If you ever really studied all of the Apostle Paul's writings, like we do in Bible Basics, you know, and you study the things that he talks to them about, he's trying to build them up. He's trying to strengthen them. He's trying to put them into a situation where things is better for them, not worse. I mean, they were having bad enough problems as it was. But nevertheless, all these things that he talks about here, Think on these things. These things here are, are worth thinking about. And it, it brings people to a greater understanding of what they need to have in their life. My time's going to get away, so I'm going to skip over a few things here and see if we can get to another place. Uh, let's look at, uh, let's see, I want to, uh, let's look at verse number 9 of Colossians chapter 3. Let me get back in the back. Ain't Burley? You want to get that one? In that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Okay. Now, there's a lot more in this ch that chapter that I'm going to talk to you about. But first of all, we're going to talk about what she just read in that very first aspect. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now. Somebody said to me one time, you know, well, I know it was a lie, but it wasn't a bad lie. Now, y'all tell me how that works. Now, somebody said it's a, there's a big old black lie, and then it's a little white lie, right? <laughs> you know, that's kind of like measuring sin. You know, a fella told me one time, he said, you know, I don't do any of them old bad sins. And I got a few that I, you know, I got, a, I got some of them little sins, but I ain't got none of them old bad sins. You ever thought about the consequences of sin? You think about what he said right here. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man. You know, most all of us, and y'all heard me say this a lot of times, you know, 
There's probably not any of us in this room that hasn't stretched the truth a little bit. Now, somebody said, that's the best way I know to talk about a lie is stretching the truth. Now, I've talked about stretching. Then you talk about distorting. And people like the idea of talking about stretching and distorting the truth. And that don't sound bad, but when you say lie, that sounds rough, don't it? Well, if, if the truth is known, how many of us have ever told a lie? Most of us. Most of us, you know. And people don't like that. They don't like to confess that. They don't like to even think about that. But, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, now, it didn't hurt nobody. You know, have, you, have people like that? They'll say, you know, I know I said that, but it didn't hurt nobody. I know it wasn't true, but it didn't hurt nobody. <laughs> you heard what Alan said. Media calls it fake news. <laughs> it's just a flat out lie. <laughs> this is one of the rules that he said, though. Now I'm going to read the rest of this for you. He said, you, do, you lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, but you put on, therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, he said. Uh, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and you be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, he says, and, an and another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him, and whatsoever you do, do it heartedly as the Lord and not unto me. Now, all that goes hand in hand. The reason I did that, because our time's nearly run out on us. But you stuff all that into what he just said in the very beginning of that verse. When you study your Bible, this is the way you do it. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. He introduces with that. And then you all this other stuff I just read to you, all that stuff is pushed into that. It starts with that. And he said, you, whatsoever you do, you do it heartedly. And you do it as the Lord says to do it and not as unto me. So, in all honesty, when you think about the importance of what we're talking about tonight, these rules that Paul made or he put out there. And when I say rules, these are things that God instilled in him as an inspirational man chosen by God and he's writing to these churches trying to build them up trying to show them things that really and truly they need not to be about and things that they do need to do and I think if we were going to put a church together and, and make the church what it ought to be some of these things right here needs to be taught and needs to be put together with the membership so that people could understand the principle of what we're talking about now, we got a couple more, and then we'll be through for tonight. I'm going to go over to, uh, let's see, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 9, 10, 11, and 12. This is four verses. Joe, we ain't called on you, so if you don't mind, would you read that for us? Brothers, love, you have no need, but I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work out your own, and work with your own hands as we command you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. Okay. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes, you know, it's easier to mind somebody else's business than it is to mind their own. Am I right? A lot of people go through life minding other people's business when they ought to be minding their own, right? I mean, sometimes people get into people's business and when they shouldn't do it. But he said, you studied to be quiet. You studied to be quiet. Well, how, what do you study and how do you learn to be quiet? Study God's Word, and he, he tells us all these things we've been talking about all night tonight. We've been talking about these things that make us better. We've been talking about these rules to live by. And he said, you study to be quiet. And he said, and to do your own business and to work with your own hands. Now, I got enough to do 
myself, and I know you do too. But I think if we do as best we can to mind our own business, we are a lot less likely to be in trouble along the way, you know. If you start trying to mind other people's business, sometimes you get into a lot of trouble. Y'all believe that? And, you know, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to try to mind somebody else. Some people's got things that I don't want to be involved in. I don't want to mind their business because I don't want to be there, you know. So this is one that here, and let's get, let's get one more out of the way here so that I can, I can make it work for us. Let's go to verse number 22 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 22. Linda. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Huh. You hear what she said? Abstain, which means, anybody got any idea about that? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. That's right, Sandy. Leave it alone. Abstain, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, what does the appearance of evil do? What, 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 how does that work? I, t- I tell you all that. I've told you this story a lot of times, but I'll tell it again. You know, when I was in the real estate business, they had real estate conferences at different places, and sometimes it would be at a motel. And it was at the Ramada Inn in, in Oxford, Alabama. And we had a big uh, conference down there on real estate, and it was going to be in one of the rooms down there. Well, the girl that works in our office, she was going with me, you know. She wanted to ride with me down there. Well, no problem, you know. I've known her husband for years, Bree Ingram, and, and we, we discussed the Bible quite a bit. He don't agree with what I agree, and I don't agree with what he agrees, but I love Michael. And, but anyway, uh, here we go walking in the motel, and this guy that I hadn't seen in years, you know, uh, he walks up and he says, well, hey, Gary, how you doing? And he looks over at her, you know, and she's standing right there beside me, you know, and we're going in, fix going in this conference. He's just looking. He didn't know what to say, you know. And uh, he said, uh, 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 he wanted to say, how's your wife? And he knew Vicky, you know, but he didn't. He, and later he called me on the telephone. He said, man, I didn't know you was divorced. I said, I didn't either. <laughs> I said, that's news to me. <laughs> he said, you mean? I said, no, we was going to a real estate conference. <laughs> I didn't explain it to him right then, you know. But it looked, you see this, the appearance of what that looked like, walking in a motel with a different woman. So did you do wrong? Huh? So did you do wrong? I, I, should, I should have I said something, but I didn't. Okay, that's what I'm asking. That's what you're doing. I, I should have said something, but I didn't. Because we was in a hurry and we was running late, just like I always am. <laughs> but anyway, yes, ma'am. the motel and she said I'll be cutting hair in that room until I can get uh, a place established and I said no that's okay when you get the place established you call me and I'll come I said but I ain't going in no motel room and somebody see me coming out (laughs) (laughs) you got to be careful that's for sure but you know abstain from the very appearance of evil there's a lot of things that looks bad, you know. That was just an example I, I just used. That looks bad. There are a lot of other things that looks bad, you know. Uh, <laughs> somebody may be coming out of a, a, a liquor store with something, uh, you know, uh, one of these, not liquor store, but one of these stores, you know, where they, and they have a big uh, arm load of something under their arm, you know. It may not be what you think it is, but they're coming out, and you're thinking, yeah, I didn't know, you know. And, you know, you can always jump to conclusions. But what we're talking about here is a rule that he put in the Bible. He said, you abstain from the very appearance of evil. Be careful not to be caught up in a situation where it looks like it's not right, you know. And, and you know, these rules that we're looking at tonight, they, they do make a difference in your life. I had about two more, but my time's up tonight. And uh, so we'll just, we'll call a, call a halt to it there. But anybody?